Hello and welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Commonwealth Chamber Hong Kong webinar today on arbitration, the Hong Kong advantage. I'm Julia Charlton, Chairman of the Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce here in Hong Kong. Andrew Wells, um, who's the main moderator here and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Chamber and I are very excited to introduce you to a trio of experts in the field of legal arbitration. As you all know, the Hong Kong government has encouraged the use of arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism to facilitate fair and quick resolution without unnecessary expense of disputes. And Hong Kong is the third most preferred place for arbitration in the world, according to the 2021 Queen Mary University of London and White and Case International Arbitration Study. The process in Hong Kong allows for an independent and neutral forum, as Hong Kong is ranked the most judicially independent in Asia, by the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report for several recent years. Also, as the first Asian arbitration statute to be based on the 2006 Onkatra model law, the arbitration ordinance introduced in 2011 grants Hong Kong's status as a user-friendly model law jurisdiction. So having said all that, our speakers today are Sarah Grimmer, the Secretary General of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, Catherine Sanger, well-known partner at the Hong Kong office of Herbert Smith and Freehills, and Murphy Mock, registered foreign lawyer, also at the Hong Kong office of Herbert Smith Freehills. As I mentioned, the main moderator for today is Andrew Wells, Secretary General of the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. The webinar will be approximately an hour with Q&A sessions following the panelists' presentations. Please feel free to share with us your questions in the Q&A section at any time during the webinar. Andrew, would you like to say some more words? Thank you very much indeed to our chairman, Julia Charlton. I'll just very briefly uh, introduce our three distinguished speakers a little further. Before do doing so, I would like to say that I personally find it appropriate that the last Commonwealth Chamber event in Hong Kong before the Chinese New Year should be on the subject of arbitration, a crucial area of professional expertise that is predicated on Hong Kong's adherence to the system of common law, which is the feature of so many Commonwealth jurisdictions. And I hope this will lead in the new year to a series of other events which showcase Hong Kong's continuing role as a, a center of different professional excellences. Our first speaker, as mentioned, is Catherine Sanger, partner, as Julia has said, in the Hong Kong office of Herbert Smith Freehills, uh, who co-chairs also the subcommittee of the Hong Kong Law Reform Commission on outcome-related fee structures for arbitration. She's got over 15 years' experience of advising clients on arbitration and litigation in this Asia-Pacific region, and uh, has done so across a wide range of sectors, with an emphasis on financial service energy and particularly main and China-related matters. Uh, reputation in China-related proceedings, I may say, is enhanced by her enviable and excellent spoken and written Chinese. Amongst many other roles, which I won't detail, Catherine was a council member of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center between 2008 up until 2019. Our second speaker will be Murphy Mock, who is a, a senior associate at HSF. Uh, he advises Chinese and international clients on disputes and projects across a wide range of areas, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, Africa, and South America, with a focus on the power and transport sectors. Murphy has extensive experience in international arbitration, both contentious and non-contentious, under various institutional centers, including the Singapore IAC, the ICC, as well as the HKIAC itself. And today, I believe he will touch on Hong Kong's role in infrastructure and construction disputes, an area of particular interest to many of us here in Hong Kong. Our third speaker, Sarah Grimmer, the Secretary General of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, now according to the main measure, the world's third largest, responsible for its international dispute resolution services and its operations in Hong Kong, but also in Seoul and Shanghai. She was formerly senior legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, and before that, a member of the Secretariat at the ICC International Court of Arbitration in Paris, where, of course, she administered commercial arbitrations under the ICC rules. Previously to that, been a member of the International Arbitration Group at Sherman and Sterling in Paris, and 
previous even to that, has practiced in New Zealand. So each of our speakers has a stellar resume. I hope that each speaker will make a roughly 15 minute presentation and will then have a panel discussion with Q and A's before handing back the floor to Julia for a final word. As Julia mentioned, we do encourage participants to put forward questions in the Q&A box at any time, the earlier the better, throughout the course of the webinar. Please do indicate if your question is addressed to any particular speaker. Without further preliminaries, I now hand over the virtual floor to Catherine Sanger. Thank you. Thank you, um, Andrew, and thank you, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with the Commonwealth Chamber of Hong Kong to be presenting with, as well as Murphy Mock, my colleague, Sarah Grimmer of the HKIAC. And we're talking about arbitration in Hong Kong, which are two of my favorite topics. I'm now going to share my screen. and Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, the theme today, as we've heard, is really Hong Kong as a centre of excellence for international commercial arbitration. It's a big topic and one that I think all three of us could talk about for some time, but we do want to leave time for Q&A at the end. And please do participate and use this as an opportunity to ask us any questions that you have. In the time available, I was going to talk about three different factors or three themes. The first really is just touching very briefly upon Hong Kong in the broader context as a thriving financial and commercial center. And that's particularly important and relevant to this topic because it's closely related to the role that Hong Kong plays as a world leading dispute resolution hub. And then I will talk about what we call the hard factors, the structural advantages that Hong Kong offers as a leading seat um, for arbitration. And as you've heard, Hong Kong has been ranked globally the third most preferred seat for international commercial arbitration. And then we'll look at the legislation and the judicial framework. And so we'll talk to you a bit more about the institution, in particular HKIC, and some of the features that distinguish Hong Kong from perhaps other seats in the region. And finally, looking at what we call the soft factors, the things that make Hong Kong attractive, that make it efficient, um, and effective as a leading seat of arbitration. And again, we don't have time to go through all of these factors, but hopefully the PowerPoint will give you an idea of what we're talking about. But in particular, given where we are and particularly what's happening in Hong Kong right now, we thought it might be useful to touch upon sort of the rise of technology in arbitration and the use of virtual hearings. So I'll look at the first topic, the Hong Kong as a thriving international commercial centre. Really, Hong Kong is in a unique position. Under the one country, two systems, policy Hong Kong is the only common law jurisdiction in China. And this, of course, is significant because it has allowed Hong Kong to develop a large body of case law that is accessible, that is highly recognized, and that is widely applicable to commercial transactions, and then of course, commercial disputes in Hong Kong. As Julia said, Hong Kong has a strong, well-established judiciary, and judicial independence is a cornerstone of um, the legal system in Hong Kong. It's mandated and guaranteed under the basic law. And at least in the world that we operate in, the commercial corporate world, evidence and case authority shows that judicial power is exercised by the judiciary free from any interference and that the quality of the judicial decisions is um, high and an essential element of the rule of law. And the three-tier court system, of course, ensures rigorous judicial oversight. And perhaps a, a unique feature of the Court of Final Appeal here in Hong Kong is that although it includes um, top judges not only from our own territory, but also non-permanent judges that are drawn from other leading common law jurisdictions around the world. And that really is unique. And it's a strong feature of our legal system and also the perception that we have internationally. And that, of course, is particularly relevant. We as counsel are persuading our clients to choose arbitration clauses that have the seat in Hong Kong and governed by Hong Kong. The strength of the legal system has also made the city one of the largest financial centres and exchanges. And I know that recent events in Hong Kong have generated commentary about Hong Kong's future, but a number of factors, including statistics in the areas of trade, in the areas of finance and investment, suggest that Hong Kong's franchise as a leading financial centre remains strong. So, for example, just to give you some statistics, and I'll read this, Hong Kong um, has remained the favoured capital market for Chinese issuers 
and the international headquarters for many of China's largest companies. Despite challenges in recent years, the number of business operations in Hong Kong with parent companies based elsewhere and the number of startups reached record highs in 2021. And the city was also ranked third by global FDI in 2020. And we think these are pretty incredible statistics. Hong Kong is also a major beneficiary of leading policies um, coming out of China. And we don't have time to go into that, but it's worth bearing in mind that you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, Murphy will have direct experience of this, has given rise to an uptick both in transactions, but of course, disputes that invariably follow deals that are done in this region. And we also have the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area Initiative, which is driving trade, driving disputes and driving collaboration between Hong Kong and the mainland. And all of these factors contribute to Hong Kong cementing its position and really maintaining its status as a leading dispute uh, resolution hub and a leading arbitration seat. Looking now at some of the hard factors, I've listed four on the slide here. We have the statutory framework, the judicial approach, arbitration institutions and special arrangements between Hong Kong and mainland China. As we've heard, Hong Kong is paving the way for being one of the most preferred seats. Really, the city offers everything that a top arbitration center requires. It has a modern statutory framework that we'll talk a little bit about. It has a very pro-arbitration judicial practice. It has world-class um, arbitration institutions and an excellent record of enforcing arbitration awards. And we also have special arrangements with mainland China for things such as getting interim relief and also enforcement, particularly of arbitration awards between Hong Kong and China. Now, I'll let Sarah talk to you about the role that the HKIC plays in all of this and the success that we have had with the interim arrangement. I can say as a practitioner that these arrangements are game changing in terms of the work that we do here and the statistics speak for themselves. But I would like to talk a little bit about the statutory framework. Arbitrations in Hong Kong are governed by the arbitration ordinance. The ordinance that we are under today came into effect on the 1st of June 2011. Under the earlier framework, there were two regimes, one for domestic arbitration and one for international arbitration. We now see a unified approach and all arbitrations in Hong Kong are um, subject to more or less the same provisions in the ordinance. And under the overarching framework of the UNCITRAL model law, which is really a best practice framework for international commercial arbitration, it's been adopted either wholesale or in, in adapted form, as it is in Hong Kong, in a number of jurisdictions around the world, including here in Hong Kong, which was a first mover and adopted the model law in 1989. So we've been working within these parameters for many years. There are a number of features of the ordinance that are worth highlighting. Confidentiality, of course, is a key feature of one of the reasons why parties choose arbitration and the arbitration ordinance has robust provisions dealing with confidentiality, which are um, replicated in the HKIAC arbitration rules. And this comes up time and time again when we talk to clients about what you can and cannot say. Sometimes it can be useful to be able to say slightly more in terms of creating pressure, but really confidentiality for most parties is an inherent feature that we are protected um, for under the ordinance. The ordinance also minimizes court supervision and intervention in the arbitration process and in the proceedings. And that's really a key feature of the um, UNCTRAL model law. And that's really subject to the safeguards that parties are free to decide how a dispute should be resolved. And if they decide that a dispute should be resolved through arbitration before an arbitration tribunal, then the court's power, the local court's power here in Hong Kong to interfere with that process should be limited and really dealing with matters of procedural integrity around the arbitration process. The ordinance also provides support for what we call emergency arbitration, which is the ability to enforce in Hong Kong emergency arbitration relief, which has been issued either in Hong Kong or outside Hong Kong. And emergency arbitration really is a feature that's been around in the past sort of five to six years, really, in terms of the ability of parties to go to an emergency arbitrator to get urgent relief before the tribunal itself is constituted. 
And I was involved with the DOJ in drafting the um, provisions in the ordinance for the enforcement of emergency relief. And I say that not to blow my own trumpet, but really just to testify to the rigour with which the DOJ approached this project and also the desire at all levels at the Department of Justice to ensure that Hong Kong has best practice legislation. I can safely say that our provisions on these types of enforcement rules are really leading practice in the world, not just in Asia. Another feature I think it's worth mentioning um, of the ordinance and also of the regime is the ability um, to have third party funding of arbitration. And again, there isn't enough time to talk about this in any real detail. But changes, as Andrew said, are also underway consistent with this to, to allow lawyers to charge success fees for arbitration proceedings in Hong Kong. And again, the DOJ has been pushing this as a way to ensure that Hong Kong stays competitive as a leading arbitration seat. And for those of you who saw the press conference, the report and the proposed recommendations to the ordinance was released at the end of last year. And we hope to see that reform come into, into force in Hong Kong very shortly. And that really is going to be, again, I think, game changing for Hong Kong as a way of enhancing the arbitration regime. Turning now to the judicial approach, and I really can't emphasize this more strongly, that the, the Hong Kong courts and the Hong Kong judges um, are very pro-arbitration and have taken a very pro-arbitration stance. And you see this in particular when you look at the enforcement of arbitration awards. There is a leading decision um, given by the arbitration judge, Justice Mimi Chan. Another unique feature of the Hong Kong judicial process is that there is a specialist arbitration and construction judge that deals with most matters of arbitration related court proceedings that come to the court. And there is a 2015 decision called KB versus S, where the court dismissed and struck out an application to set aside an order to enforce an arbitration award. But also that then Justice Chan took the opportunity to set out what she called the 10 principles or the 10 commandments of enforcement. And those commandments really don't just inform the enforcement process, but inform the way that the courts deal with matters coming before them relating to arbitration. So just to give you a flavour, I won't read out all 10, but the, the, the judge said the primary aim of the courts is to facilitate the arbitral process and to assist with enforcement. The court should interfere only where that is expressly provided for in the ordinance and enforcement of awards should be, and I quote, almost a matter of administrative procedure, close quote, and the court process should be, quote, mechan as mechanistic as possible, close quote. And that gives parties real comfort that when they choose Hong Kong as a seat for arbitration, that the courts are not going to set aside an arbitration award here or when it comes to enforcement, allow a losing party to challenge that award on grounds that are anything less than rigorous. And the court has made it clear that it won't look into the merits of the underlying transactions, but is really looking to the structural or procedural integrity of the arbitration process. And as I've said, the Hong Kong courts are known for their expertise. And this, I think, is particularly important because sometimes you see judgments coming out of other jurisdictions in this part of the world. And you, we, as arbitration practitioners, you might wonder uh, what the judge was thinking or why that particular decision has been met. I can safely say that when you read the judgments coming out of the Hong Kong courts, they are often not a surprise. And therefore, it just goes to the predictability of the common law system and the way that we operate under the arbitration ordinance. Um, in Hong Kong is also a uh, party to the New York Convention. Through being part of China, China has acceded to the New York Convention on behalf of Hong Kong. And again, that's important because one of the benefits that Murphy will talk about is the ability to enforce arbitration awards under the convention. And now we have, I think, over 160 signatories to the New York Convention. So that, again, is another reason why Hong Kong is a preferred seat and also generates an award which is enforceable in other New York Convention countries. And Sarah, uh, perhaps we can talk about, as between Hong Kong and China, we have a separate arrangement because the convention doesn't apply because Hong Kong is not a separate country. It is a, it is a region of China, but we have a separate arrangement between Hong Kong and China, which to all intents and purposes replicates the New York Convention. So you'll see on the slides, I mentioned there the key institutions in 
um, Hong Kong, the HKIC, the ICCC has a presence here and also CTAC. I won't say too much about that and you'll hear from Sarah directly about what the HKIC is doing. But again, that is indicative of, of the way that other institutions perceive Hong Kong as a center um, or as an, an excellent seat for arbitration. And then again, on the next slide, you, I, we mentioned there the arrangements. I put these, these up just so that you don't forget about them. I won't talk about them in any detail, but it is worth um, bearing in mind that the interim relief arrangement that Sarah will talk about um, really is we do something here in Hong Kong that no other jurisdiction can offer. And that really is um, very important. And finally, being conscious of time, there's a very nice picture there of Hong Kong through the clouds. Looking at the soft factors, you'll see there are a number of factors that we've put on the slide, governing law, institutional rules, cost and duration, China-related expertise, language, location, and technology. All of these are factors that contribute to Hong Kong being an attractive seat, really for all types of international commercial arbitration, but perhaps with a particular emphasis, and most recently on China-related arbitrations. And that, of course, is important, as we've said, for the Belt and Road Initiative in particular, which is picking up, we are picking up a lot of disputes through that initiative. I won't spend too much time talking about these factors, perhaps just a, it's worth spending a minute on Hong Kong law as a governing law. Increasingly, we arbitrate under all types of governing law. It's not unusual to have an arbitration before the HKAC where you might have a suite of contracts. They might all provide for HKAC arbitration. One contract might be governed by Korean law, a civil law jurisdiction. Then you might have a supporting contract, a financing contract governed by Hong Kong law or by English law. And that's not unusual. And tribunals in this are very well equipped to deal with arbitrations under different governing laws. Hong Kong, as a governing law of the contract, is a much often law that is chosen. It has its origins in English law. We have the advantage as a common law jurisdiction taking case law from all leading common um, law jurisdictions. And as I said, the Hong Kong courts have a very good track record of being even handed in enforcing commercial agreements and enforcing commercial um, and contractual obligations, not just against international parties, but also against local Hong Kong and Chinese parties. And that, of course, is important to clients that are investing in the region and want to ensure that whether they're before a tribunal or before the court, that they will have a fair hearing. But with the minutes left available to me, I thought I would spend a little bit of time about looking at technology and in particular arbitration in a virtual world. And there's a lot that's been said about this recently, of course, because over the past two years, it's been very difficult and now almost impossible to travel freely um, in and out of Hong Kong. And of course, many parts of Asia and the world have been under similar restrictions. And so we've seen a real uptick in arbitrations that are taking place virtually. And again, it's worth thinking about, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that something that we want to see continuing to happen when we revert to the new normal once hopefully um, restrictions are lifted or at least relaxed? And I have to say, the first thing I would say is that the statistics really, again, are quite illuminating. In 2020, I discovered that of the 117 cases in HKSC, over 80 were either fully virtual or partially virtual. So that's about 70% of cases. And I personally have had about five or six cases, most of them with the HKIC, that have been virtual in some format. And it's very, it can be very efficient. The HKIC has a very, has a very experienced case um, management system and, and case handlers who are well equipped and have expertise in matters of technology which of course, when we're all dealing with, even with, we're just dealing with this webinar today, it's vital to have, we've all got IT people on standby in case anything goes wrong. And I can testify that the HKSC is um, very well experienced now in dealing with virtual hearings. The ability to run a hearing virtual, of course, has huge amounts of flexibility, particularly if a hearing is procedural in nature and parties don't necessarily want to fly council around the world and parties around the world to attend if it's just going to be an hour, two hours, of a hearing. Users actually have also voted with their feet. There's a survey that takes place every year that's run by the Queen Mary Institution of Arbitration. Um, the, the latest results showed when faced with the decision whether to cancel a hearing 
or to have it virtually, 79% of users said they would prefer to have the hearing virtually than lose the hearing completely, which is a pretty high number. Only 16% voted that they would prefer to postpone it until the hearing would take place in person. And 4% only said that they would want the hearing on documents only. And you can see some of the advantages on the slides. Um, actually, you get a greater flexibility and availability of hearing dates. When you have a very experienced tribunal, it can be quite difficult to find a 10 week, a 10 day hearing date when all of them can be available in a particular city. But the moment you offer them the ability to be virtual, then those dates become a lot more available to you. So we've been able to schedule hearings much quicker. We find that people are more willing to appoint younger arbitrators from different jurisdictions because when you're virtual, it can make less of a difference than when you need everyone to be present in the same room. And of course, it can be a little bit cheaper and it has less of an impact on the environment. Personally, I can say that I did a hearing last year that was partly in Chinese and partly in English. And that proved to be very effective when it was done virtually because um, the cross-examination um, was done in English, but the answers were given in Chinese. And I had an earpiece in my ear just in case I couldn't pick up some of the answers that I wasn't completely reliant on the Chinese that I'd learned at university. But it meant that I could have someone sitting in a room in Shanghai speaking to my ear that no one else heard and meant that, that the cross-examination was very effective. If we'd been in a hearing room, I think it would have been much more disruptive. It was so effective that by the end of the hearing, everybody in the room, including the very fluent chair of the tribunal, asked to have access to the same interpretation because he could see that it was not being disrupted to the hearing and it wasn't adding any extra cost. And so that he took advantage of that same process. And so that was particularly efficient, I think, as an arbitration hearing. Um, in terms of the bad, I think time zones is an off-sighted reason. Because tribunals are more diverse, it's not uncommon to have an arbitrator or a council sitting in the US, someone in Europe, someone in Asia, someone in Australia. And that could mean that some parties have some very antisocial um, hours. And that question was raised recently, whether does that mean that you know, you're less likely to choose an arbitrator in Hong Kong for a European seated arbitration, because that means you're then going to be into different time zones. I would say that hasn't been a factor, but it is perhaps one of the least attractive sides of virtual hearings and having to navigate long stressful hearings 5 to 8 a.m. in the morning or 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. at night. It does mean that the hearing days tend to be shorter and screen fatigue is another reason that parties cite. Often it can be hard to sit on a screen for an eight hour hearing. So these are some of the downsides. Some parties say you know, it can be difficult perhaps to read a witness. You have the witness's face on the screen. So, if you, so perhaps you see the witness's face more closely. If there's sweat dripping down the brow, then you see that but you don't see the twitching feet under the table. You don't get the full body language. And it's important at the outset to agree with your tribunal, the protocols for navigating you know, who else is in the room, make sure what notes did witnesses have on their table? Have they put their phone in their drawer and locked it, for example? Have you found a neutral venue where people can go and give evidence so that you can try to control that process as much as possible. But on the whole, I would say the pros outweigh the cons, particularly where we are not able to travel. In terms of the ugly, a couple of war stories, I think know your tribunal. Some tribunals, particularly the more experienced uh, uh, arbitrators, might be very good at running complex arbitration, but at less good at running technology. And we've had experiences where tribunals have run entire hearings on their iPhone and then, for example, gone to the toilet and forgotten to turn their iPhone off when they've gone to the toilet during the hearing and things like that. Or they've shared their screen and shared their entire email and you know, with confidential communications between arbitrators and then not being to turn off their screen sharing function. So I think it's important, A, to know your tribunal and just test as much as possible before the hearing. Um, and that usually is a way of um, mitigating, if not completely eliminating some of the things that might go wrong during a virtual hearing. But I think, you know, just going back to the study that I talked about, people were asked, you know, when we're back to a new normal, what do you want? Do you want to keep going you know, fully virtual or will you go back to flying around the world? Most people have said for procedural hearings, they're happy for it to be virtual. But I think everyone accepts that when we can go back to a new normal, whatever that normal is, that in-person in hearings will, will come 
come back in some form. But I think it just means that arbitrators and parties will be more willing to have less key witnesses in certain parts of the hearing that can take place virtually without undue objection, which historically might have caused you no know, more issues than I think it would today. So I'll finish there. I hope I've kept to time, Andrew, and I'll pass on to Murphy. Thank you. Very much indeed, uh, Catherine, for that very comprehensive and um, reassuring presentation. Can I now please hand over to Murphy? Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Kath. I'm just going to try to present my slides before I start. I don't know if everyone can see this, okay. Great, thank you very much, Andrew and Catherine. And, and on, on the back of Kath's excellent summary of the advantages of Hong Kong as an arbitration center, I wanted just to go back to some fundamental questions for commercial parties. First is why choose arbitration? How to get an arbitration agreement? And what does the arbitration process look like? These are some of the basic questions that we often get asked by uh, clients and parties in a dispute. So before I wrap up my session, I will at the end talk a little bit about arbitration involving construction disputes, as Andrew and Kath mentioned earlier. This represents a significant portion of the cases handled by major international arbitration centers, and it's an area we think will likely be quite active in the coming years. So to start, some basics. What is arbitration? It's a way of resolving a dispute outside national courts, essentially. It's based on the party's agreement to arbitrate their disputes rather than to litigate. The agreement provides for fair resolution of the disputes by an impartial tribunal. That tribunal is often selected by the parties themselves and acts as the judges to determine the dispute. The arbitration must be based in a legal system, and this is what we call the seat of the arbitration and it should be governed by a set of rules on how the arbitration will run. It's an adversarial process and it's much more similar to litigation than say mediation, negotiation on, or some other forms of uh, alternative dispute resolution. Usually the arbitration is subject to a minimal intervention by a national court, as Kath mentioned earlier, but the court is there to provide backup and support to the parties if required. The tribunal will issue an arbitral award and that is final and binding, and if necessary, the award can be enforced around the world. So that's arbitration in a nutshell, and we'll come back to the practice of arbitration a little bit later. Another question we get asked often is why should parties choose arbitration over litigation? There's a host of reasons. Just like litigation, you have finality with arbitration, perhaps even more so than litigation. The arbitration process provides a binding outcome and has very limited rights for parties to appeal. Another reason is neutrality. Arbitration is a neutral method of dispute resolution. There is no court with jurisdiction to determine the merits of the dispute. And this is particularly attractive in cross-border transactions where the parties are from different countries. They often don't want to litigate in an unknown jurisdiction or in their opponent's home state where there might be a home turf advantage. And then there's privacy. In arbitration, there are no bystanders, press, or members of the public watching you fight it out like there are in court proceedings. This can be also a relevant uh, consideration where decision against a party could trigger similar claims. There is no public precedent since awards are not generally published. And perhaps the biggest advantage is the enforceability of arbitration award, as Kath mentioned earlier. In litigation, you can't enforce a court judgment outside the state where it's made unless there is a specific enforcement treaty between the two countries or unless that country has its own domestic process for enforcing judgments of foreign countries. There are relatively few treaties and processes that allow for this. With arbitration, on the other hand, parties can take advantage of the New York Convention. As mentioned earlier, it's a regime to enforce arbitral awards internationally, which is not open to judgments of domestic courts. The convention can and has been actually signed by well over 80% of the countries in the world. And that means you can enforce your award in any one of those countries. The grounds to refuse enforcement are very limited. And if your opponent starts litigation in any of those countries in breach of your arbitration agreement, the court of those countries will stay the litigation in favor of your arbitration. Another benefit is flexibility. Parties have a high degree of control over the main aspects of their arbitration. 
you have the option to choose your arbitrator. In litigation, parties have no say in the selection of judges, but in arbitration, party appointment of arbitrators allows you to choose someone with the relevant sector experience or knowledge pertaining to your dispute. If you want someone like a judge, you could choose, for example, a Queen's counsel or senior counsel or a retired member of the bench, but you could also choose an experienced arbitrator or even a sector specialist partner from an international law firm who are familiar with your contractual documentation and the party's expectations. You can also choose your counsel in arbitration. You don't need to choose lawyers with rights of audience in that particular jurisdiction. In nearly all cases, you can choose uh, someone who you have worked over many years to represent you anywhere in the world in an arbitration. And unlike litigation, where you're bound by the rules of the relevant court, you can choose the procedure and conduct of the arbitration. But with this flexibility and autonomy afforded to the parties, it means that you have to be quite, quite careful when drafting your arbitration agreement. What does an arbitration agreement have to include? First is a clear agreement to arbitrate. This is an agreement to opt out of submitting your dispute to the national court that would otherwise have jurisdiction over it. The scope of the clause should be adequately wide to capture the types of dispute you have in mind, and it must be clear and mandatory in terms of the use of its language to refer the disputes to arbitration. You need to specify a seat of arbitration. That is the country where the arbitration is rooted. It must be a state that is party to the New York Convention, so the award can be enforced in other member states. The seat needs to be an arbitration-friendly jurisdiction, uh, meaning the courts should have limited ability to review the award, and the award can be challenged on very limited grounds. You also want to set out the governing law of your arbitration agreement. The arbitration agreement has its own governing laws because legally it is separable from the larger commercial agreement it's contained in. There has been a lot of cases in recent years on what law should govern the arbitration agreement, and this will in turn have an impact on its validity and enforceability. So it's important to spell out the governing law to avoid these kind of disputes. The arbitration clause should also refer to an arbitration institution and their rules. The chosen institution will administer your arbitration, which will run in accordance with the institution's rules. A clear and robust set of procedural rules will help to ensure that arbitration is well managed and run efficiently. You should also specify the number of arbitrators. For low value contracts, you usually just have one arbitrator, often appointed by the institution. But for more complex transactions, the tribunal is commonly made up of three arbitrators the first two appointed by the parties, and the third by the two appointed arbitrators. And finally, you should specify the language of the arbitration. If the parties speak different languages, you can save a lot of time and money by agreeing on one language in which to conduct the arbitration. That said, this is not always possible. And in our experience, it's not uncommon for arbitration to be bilingual. As Kat mentioned earlier, we have experience dealing with arbitration in both Chinese and English. In fact, Hong Kong has a large pool of bilingual and multilingual international dispute resolution professionals. So it's very well placed to deal with arbitration in multiple languages. The next point we want to look at is what does an arbitration clause look like having now discussed all of these key components. I've set out here on the slide the uh, HKIAC model arbitration clause. We can see that it provides all the ingredients we discussed earlier, including clear wording on the scope of disputes to be arbitrated. It makes clear the arbitration will be administered by HKIAC. Specific procedural rules to apply, this being the HKIAC administered arbitration rules. The governing law of the arbitration agreement, the seat and language of arbitration, and the number of arbitrators that will make up the tribunal. So this is a well-drafted, clear and concise arbitration agreement. If you don't have a precedent to work from a good start is to check the arbitration institution's model form clause like this one. They are usually available on the institution's website. And in most situations, the clause will be enough to provide for arbitration under your contract. I just wanted to spend a few moments explaining the arbitration process, having explained the clause itself. In many respects, the arbitration procedure isn't hugely different to litigation. You start with a request for arbitration and the respondent produces a response. Both tend to be short documents setting out the basic details of the dispute and any preliminary issues. 
After this, the parties will usually produce statements of case, just like you would in litigation. These are more detailed submissions, but they're usually less regimented in structure. There will then be submission of witness statements and expert reports from each party in support of their case. There will also be a period of document production, although this will be less extensive than common law disclosure. And after all the evidence is submitted, you may have a pre-hearing brief, a bit like skeleton arguments in litigation. The party's case and evidence will then be heard in an evidentiary hearing in front of the arbitrators. The hearing will usually involve each party's counsel giving oral openings and cross-examination of witnesses and experts. The arbitrators will then go away and produce a reasoned decision called an award rather than a judgment. Just as you could in litigation, you can request a stay of your arbitration from the tribunal in order for mediation or any informal settlement discussions to take place. And this will usually be granted. But unlike the court, there is no requirement for parties to consider alternative dispute resolution. And if you settle your dispute, you can ask the tribunal to issue a consent award. This records the terms of the settlement agreement between the parties. And it means that you can enforce the award if the other side fails to comply with the settlement agreement. You can also obtain most, if not all, of the interim reliefs in an arbitration as you would from the courts in litigation. Hearings in arbitration tend to be shorter. These usually span over one to two weeks with short oral openings, a chess clock system allowing the parties to share hearing time equally, and there are often no oral closings. And that's because the arbitration tries to strike a balance between common and civil law processes with a focus on written evidence than in litigation. Uh, there, there is cross-examination in arbitration, but usually there's no direct examination. So witness statements tend to stand as evidence in chief. Your solicitors usually tend to do the advocacy in arbitration. We often don't tend to have external barristers appointed and this is the case for about 90% of the arbitrations we handle at our firm. One area that has been mentioned earlier is construction arbitration. This is an area we expect to see quite a lot of activity in the coming years. And the background up to the likelihood of dispute is because there has been a lot of investment in this space in recent years, driven by China's Belt and Road Initiative, which spans over 140 countries and other infrastructure investments by countries such as Japan and Korea. They cover a wide range of sectors like transport, energy, and technology. A lot of these projects are approaching completion, and these often involve disputes as to who should pay for the cost of delays to the project, both before and after COVID-19, uh, and the cost of dealing with defective works and carrying out works that parties had not contemplated at the start of the project. At our firm, we've been helping a lot of companies in handling these disputes. In our experience, arbitration is by far the most popular method to resolve construction disputes. The general trend in Asia is to arbitrate them outside the host country, with Hong Kong and Singapore as the preferred seats of arbitration. Construction disputes can be quite different to other commercial disputes. They tend to involve complex technical issues industry terms, construction law principles, and industry-specific standard form contracts with a lot of technical specifications. So construction disputes tend to be heavy on documents and technical and factual evidence. Parties typically would engage experts to give technical evidence, and what you often see and hearing is the use of hot tubbing for cross-examination of expert witnesses. And this involves one expert giving an opinion and the other expert responding, with the tribunal having the chance to put questions to both experts. The complexity of construction dispute means that managing arbitration efficiently is crucial. And that is why the majority of construction arbitrations are administered by an arbitration institution like the HKIAC. And on that note, I would end my presentation here and hand over to Sarah to explain to us a bit more about the HKIAC. Thank you very much indeed, Murphy. Okay, so thank you very much to the Hong Kong Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk quite quickly about HKIAC, specifically our uh, structure and 
what a typical year looks like at HKIC in terms of cases and busyness. And then I want to focus on the interim measures arrangement and also the um, mutual enforcement of awards between Hong Kong and mainland China. And also just end on a word about our virtual hearing experience. So HKIAC, for many of you on this webinar, we're familiar to you. We're founded in 1985, so 36 years old. We've managed approximately 11,000 cases, and we do a whole range of dispute resolution, so arbitration, mediation, adjudication, domain name disputes, and also very importantly, uh, a full hearing center, and that's a combined model at HKIAC. Unlike some of the other major arbitral institutions, the teams that work at HKIC on our arbitration cases work closely with the staff who also run cases. And I'll come back at the end and talk about that a little bit within the context of virtual hearings. As you've heard a few times on this webinar, we were voted top three arbitral institution in the world, and Hong Kong was the third most preferred seat. You've also heard that we have offices not only in Hong Kong, but also in Seoul and in Shanghai for quite a few years now. Our organizational structure, I would describe as lean. We have a governing body of 25 members, our HKIAC Council, that's made up of dispute resolution experts all over the world, not only lawyers, but also in-house counsel. And we think that's a very important aspect of the representation on our body. I want to talk specifically about two of the standing committees that are here in the black boxes the Proceedings Committee and the Appointments Committee. Those committees are populated partly by HKIAC council members and also by experts external to HKIAC who are brought in because of their expertise. And those bodies, as well as our council, are all supported by the HKIAC Secretariat, which is international in nature. So the Proceedings Committee and the Appointments Committee, the reason I want to talk about these committees and focus on them a little bit more is because these are the experts who are making decisions in HKIAC cases. And I think it's very important for users, parties, as well as lawyers to know who is making the decisions in their cases, because that gives you a real comfort around how your case is going to be run. So if I start with the appointments committee, well, across both committees, the way they are populated is with experts. So we're talking about practitioners, arbitrators, as well as in-house counsel. So when these bodies make decisions in cases, they know what impact those decisions will have in cases because they themselves run cases, arbitrate cases, and are party representatives to cases. Our appointments committee, this is currently comprised of eight experts who are located in four different um, parts of the world, Hong Kong, New York, Beijing, and Zurich, in normal, let's say, non-pandemic times, also Singapore. And so these experts cover quite a range of legal sectors as well as jurisdictions. And this is one of our most busy committees. They make approximately 150 appointments per year. And those appointments are based on a detailed, reasoned recommendation from the Secretariat we have a lot of information on our website. One of the pieces of information is a practice note on how we make appointments. And there we list 15 factors that we take into account when we are looking at who to appoint in a case. So the takeaway message for those of you listening is that it is a very deliberate and careful exercise. And the appointments committee appoints people on an as needed basis. So we don't wait for a fixed date to make an appointment. We work with our committees on an as needed basis. So when an appointment needs to be made, we get that up to our committee and we try to make the appointment as soon as possible. The proceedings committee makes decisions in contested procedural matters. So for example, if there is an application for an arbitration to be expedited uh, and the other side uh, objects, then the proceedings committee will decide whether or not the criteria have been met under our rules uh, for a case to be expedited. Again, it is populated by experts from all around the world with a strong base in Hong Kong. And so located across six different jurisdictions, Asia, Europe, and the US. And you see there a brief description of all of the nationalities that we have represented on those two very important bodies. What about our cases over, I'm presenting here the 2020 case statistics. You might all say, hang on, it's January, but we traditionally release our statistics for the past year after Chinese New Year. 
here. So those will be released in uh, a couple of weeks. That's quite a detailed set of information. So you will see that come through. But in terms of 2020, what we saw was a record year, 318 arbitrations, many domain name disputes and a few mediations, most of which were domestic cases. That's very typical for any given year. A closer look at some of our other statistics, as I've already mentioned, approximately 150 arbitrator appointments every year. One of our most important functions is appointing arbitrators, of course. Over 70% of our cases were international. That's typical. It's usually between 70 and 80 per year, but then there's also an important number of cases that are Hong Kong based. Uh, across all of the quantified disputes, the total amount in dispute was 8.8 .8 billion US dollars. And that really covers a wide span of your very small case through to your very large deal, which involves 1.5 billion US dollars and up, and everything in between. There's a caveat there that covers only quantified cases. So there are other cases not captured in that figure. The seat of arbitration in most of our cases is Hong Kong, but we also see other seats such as Singapore, London, and more recently, Moscow. That's because of our work in Russia. The governing law, Hong Kong is the most preferred governing law in our cases. Number two is English law. No surprise there, given the uh, history of Hong Kong. And number three is Chinese law. Again, not surprising uh, given where we are. And the languages in our cases, 80% of our cases are in English only, but there's an important proportion of cases that are either only in Chinese or bilingual Chinese English. What kinds of disputes are we seeing? Every year, the top kind of dispute we see is international trade disputes, sale of goods. Number two for 2020 was maritime, and number three was corporate disputes. I think that in 2021, that will switch and we'll see more corporate disputes because that is really common. And that's where a lot of the high stake disputes are that we are seeing. What about the provenance of the parties in our cases? This is something that doesn't change too much year on year. Number one is Hong Kong parties. Number two, mainland Chinese parties. Number three and number five are the offshore jurisdictions, BVI and Cayman Islands. And always in the top 10, top five is American parties, Singapore and South Korea. So those are pretty much mainstays. And then you have a, a number of different European jurisdictions that show up every year. I wanted to now spend a bit of time talking in some detail about the interim measures arrangement because this webinar is about the advantages of Hong Kong. And one of the unique advantages of Hong Kong that you've already heard about is the interim measures arrangement. Here are some key dates with respect to that arrangement coming into force. In April 2019, HKIAC was recognized as an eligible institution. I'll, I'll tell you what that means. In September 2019, this is important for those of you who will be relying on the interim measures arrangement, is a note published by the Supreme People's Court of China, which is a, an authoritative guide on the implementation of the arrangement. This is a, a note which guides the implementation of the arrangement across all mainland Chinese courts. So it is highly authoritative. And then, of course, in October 2019, the arrangement came into force. So it's now been in place for two years. And more. What does it do? The main point with respect to the arrangement is it means that parties to arbitration seated in Hong Kong can now, for the first time, have direct access to the mainland Chinese courts for interim relief. And that interim relief includes preservation of assets, evidence, and conduct. Was put in the form of a reciprocal arrangement, meaning that also mainland Chinese parties could have access to Hong Kong courts directly for interim relief. But the thing is that was already available under the legislation in Hong Kong, uh, very progressive legislation you've already heard from CAF. So it is reciprocal, but the real uh, change, the meaningful change is that you can seat your arbitration in Hong Kong and therefore have access to an ANSI trial model law based legislation and independent judiciary with specialist judges dealing with Hong Kong, uh, dealing with arbitrations in a common law jurisdiction and have access to the mainland Chinese courts for interim relief. So what is HKIAC's role under this arrangement? When a party makes an application to a mainland Chinese court for relief, it must include in that application a certificate issued by one of the eligible institutions. There are six, we are one of them, saying that institution has accepted the arbitration and the seat is Hong Kong. 
Now, this is as per templates that have been issued by the Supreme People's Court. And the significance of the Supreme People's Court it is that it is the entity within mainland China that agreed the arrangement with the DOJ of Hong Kong. So we are an eligible institution. To date, we have received 60 applications for a certificate under the arrangement. So we have seen 60 applications be made in HKIAC administered arbitrations to mainland Chinese courts. What have we seen come of these applications? We have seen a lot of success. We know of, at the moment, 41 court decisions, and these decisions are in respect of asset preservation applications. We know of 38 court decisions where those applications to preserve assets were granted, and the total amount of assets that have now been covered by preservation orders by different mainland Chinese courts totals $1.9 US billion dollars. So that is a commercially significant benefit to choosing Hong Kong as a seat and choosing HKIAC or one of the other institutions as an administering institution, because it gives you this protection. This means for the applicants in those proceedings that they now have assets that have been preserved, they cannot be dissipated. And so if they prevail in the underlying arbitration, they can now be assured that they can enforce the award against those assets. So it's really all about making the arbitration ultimately enforceable, which is why you go to arbitration in the first place. There's something interesting to note from our experience is that of the applicants, 80% are foreign parties and 20% are mainland Chinese parties. So it's not just foreign parties filing these applications, it's also mainland Chinese parties filing the applications, sometimes against other mainland Chinese parties and other entities. But as, what is also very interesting is that of the respondents to these applications, a very large proportion are foreign parties who own assets on the mainland. In this slide, you can also see all of the mainland Chinese courts, there are 25, which have received applications under the arrangement. So there is a growing level of experience amongst different mainland Chinese courts. And we at HKIC observe how these applications are being dealt with. We noticed that at the beginning, around the time of the outbreak of the pandemic, there was some delay in issuing interim relief, but that has sped up significantly in our experience. And the median time for a court to issue uh, an order is 7.5 days. The average time, according to what we know, is 18 days. Just to end on the interim measures arrangement, if you need any information about that, you can visit our website. Because as I say, we trace the outcomes very closely. We publish the information. As soon as we have additional information, we update what we publish. We have a document called the Frequently Asked Questions about the Interim Measures Arrangement. If you have any questions, go there first. We also provide English translations of all of the major texts. Kath also mentioned the uh, arrangement on enforcement of awards. This is uh, the arrangement between Hong Kong and mainland China with respect to the enforcement of awards, because of course the New York Convention is not applicable. But this document mirrors is the New York Convention. It was supplemented in 2020 and made a couple of important changes. The first was that under this supplement agreement, now parties can seek to enforce an award both in Hong Kong and in mainland China at the same time. But when a court is to enforce an award, it will communicate with the other courts to make sure that there is no enforcement over and above what is uh, awarded in the award. And secondly, this arrangement now reflects award interim relief from mainland Chinese courts. So you have the interim measures arrangement, which, which takes you up to the point in time where you have the arbitral award issued, and then you have the amendment to this arrangement, which takes you with respect to post-award interim relief as it is required under the arrangement. And what is important to know and is uh, comforting, I think, for users is that we have had a very good experience under the arrangement in terms of HKIAC awards being enforced. We have it confirmed from the PRC Supreme People's Court that only three HKIAC awards have not been enforced since 2020. And those non-enforcements were not in respect of the institution or the rules but were with respect to the scope of the tribunal's jurisdiction. So a very good rate of enforcement for HKIC awards going into mainland China. I would say that's not to say that there aren't any issues sometimes with enforcing awards in mainland China. I think that is an experience that um, is shared across different institutions and in terms of ad hoc awards, but in terms of formal non-enforcement decisions, a very good track record from HKIC.
Let me now just quickly conclude with respect to a word on our virtual hearings experience, because it has now been two years and up that we've been living in a virtual hearing environment. We had to pivot very quickly at HKIC to service our tribunals and our parties in respect of what they needed to make sure that their cases would keep going. We issued a set of guidelines in May 2020 to give parties some of the most important lessons that we had gleaned from our uh, activity up until that date, which already was quite significant. In August 2020, we invested a lot of money in our, one of our major hearing rooms to make it into a dedicated virtual hearing suite. So for example, there are cameras that capture every angle of the room, and there's a new audio system and a new backbone, all very important investments. We doubled our IT team and we worked very closely with parties and tribunals. And in the early days, it was new to, to many people. What we do is we have early conversations with parties. We help parties and tribunals design their virtual hearing. So they may not know what they need, but we'll tell them what they need. And then, of course, we run testing sessions with every single participant in the hearing. And we provide a hearing manager who is available 24-7. So that team works on a 24-7 basis now. We have dealt with almost 200 virtual hearings now, so partial and fully virtual hearings. And they are the majority of the types of hearings that we do run, even more so last year than in 2020, as you can see from those statistics in the middle column. We have conducted every kind of virtual hearing from your very simple short hearing through to your multi-week document heavy, multiple time zone hearing involving complex technical information and we've provided all services. So simultaneous interpretation, court reporting, live note, witnesses, experts, expert hot tubbing, electronic uh, presentation of evidence, you name it, we've done it. So there's a lot of uh, really important experience that we have and that we can share and with parties and tribunals and make sure that their experience and their hearing is streamlined. And it's really been quite successful in that we are not just running HKIC cases, but we're also running our CAC hearings, ICC hearings, but also for many court proceedings in the world. We've even run a hearing for the Supreme Court of British Columbia in Canada, as well as many courts in Asia, Kuala Lumpur, Thailand, Singapore, and also, of course, for the Hong Kong courts. So it's been a, a success story, and we will continue to help parties and tribunals as much as we can. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew. And then hopefully we have time for some questions. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that comprehensive introduction to the HKIAC and the insights into the um, new degree of enforceability of arbitration-related matters within the mainland. Maybe I could start off the um, Q&A. Uh, we've had quite a few Q&A coming in, but I would take this opportunity to urge participants to write in with Q&A if we don't have time to finish them. Today, we can always pass them to the participants later. Yes, if I can perhaps start with um, a couple of very general questions. The first is a, a question that I have is a layman's question. It's a sort of two-part question, and maybe both Catherine and uh, Sarah would have a view. It's this, despite Hong Kong's obvious advantages, which you've highlighted, Singapore continues to be rated higher in some respects as a preferred arbitration center and was shown as being so in the latest international survey last year to which you referred. How do you see that trend developing, if it is a trend? And related to that question, another thing which um, comes out of looking at the, this type of information to a layman is that in recent years, there seem to have been more and more regional arbitration centers emerging, as opposed to the traditional very large centers such as um, London and, and, and New York. Would you like to comment on that and how Hong Kong fits into that? And maybe also, since we're on the subject of the mainland, Shanghai, uh, or either Sarah or Catherine or I, both, whoever would like to take that. Why don't I kick off? I think on the question of Singapore and Hong Kong, they are two very excellent arbitration seats and arbitration centres. I think that there's a long history of them vying neck and neck for very close rankings in the survey that you're talking about. I think they play different roles and they service different types of cases. I think Hong Kong will continue to pave the way for, in particular, the China-related disputes. And we can talk a bit about what that means vis-a-vis -vis the regional 
um, institutions as well, but I think um, Singapore um, will not usurp Hong Kong's role in that. Likewise, Singapore picks up a lot of the Southeast Asian type disputes. And so again, Hong Kong isn't really competing for those types of cases. I think there can be, people have different reasons for choosing different institutions, but I think Hong Kong will remain very relevant, particularly as we go forward. And as we see an uptick in particular on things like the Belt and Road disputes, I think of Hong Kong's position you know, it is very well placed to pick up the bulk of that work so I think Hong Kong's status as a sort of leading seat will only grow and I think Singapore will go hand in hand because as Asia is I think one of the busiest jurisdictions now for disputes and in particular arbitrations and so I think they will both remain equally relevant you know, we do different types of disputes I'll pause there maybe Sarah can comment and then I can deal with your question in relation to the um, mainland institutions quickly. Yeah, I um, would echo what Kath said. I think Singapore has there are a lot of great things about Singapore. They have great legislation. They have a really highly functioning institution, same as Hong Kong. And so I think that so it's not surprising that both centres are really successful. And as Kath has alluded to, Singapore does a lot of India work. We do a lot of China work. I think Singapore does very well promoting itself as well. And it's been the case for a very long time that Hong Kong and Singapore have been juxtaposed as competing centres. And they really do, I think, act as leaders in this field, especially in the region and important leaders in the region in terms of developing legislation, developing offerings from the institutions, and then others follow. But I also think that from the, that most recent survey, what we saw was that we are really competing with some of the more traditional institutions and seats, not just as Asian regional centres, but as something that is seen as much more international. And I think if you choose HKIC or SEAC, you will get an internationally run arbitration, there's no question. And that's partly why I, I looked at our committees, because our committees are international. With respect to regional institutions, yeah, there are quite a few new ones that are coming along in recent years. I think with starting an institution, it's quite difficult because you do need to garner confidence by users. So users need to take a chance. Whereas if you choose one of the long running institutions, you know that you're going to get high quality service. Thank you. Catherine, did you want to come back very briefly, you said on the... Um... Yes, I can comment. And actually, something that we've been talking with our mainland colleagues um, about, we have a busy arbitration practice on the mainland as well. This is something we discuss. I think obviously these institutions are taking probably more domestic star cases at the moment. I think from our perspective, doing more of the international work, um, there's still quite a big gap between the sort of the arbitration rage the underlying law in Hong Kong and on the mainland and the PRC arbitration law is undergoing reform as we speak to bring it more in line with international practice. So there's still a bit of a gap in terms of both the law and also the sort of the, the procedure. So at this stage, I think it's still early stages. I think there's no doubt that arbitration as a method of resolving disputes in China is booming. And the Chinese government has made it very clear that for not just Belt and Road type cases, but also all kind of commercial disputes, that they see arbitration as being a preferred method for resolving those disputes. And so they're on the domestic side as well as the international side, which is, is good for all of us, really. I think most of the cases currently before these local institutions have some kind of domestic element, either domestic or some sort of Sino-foreign JV dispute. And there are rules around when you can or cannot seat arbitrations outside China for a Chinese contract. In terms of Shanghai, I think Shanghai is seen as a leader because of the free trade zone and the efforts that have been there to open that up and also to allow institutions like HKIC to start administering arbitrations onshore, which is something that's going to happen to make it a more level playing field. So Shanghai, I think, is definitely leading the way. My Beijing colleagues tell me, though, that they don't like to go to Shanghai because it's too far so if they they wouldn't choose shanghai they would choose beijing or ctac beijing or the bac the beijing arbitration commission which is actually really innovative and has been around for, for, for a much longer time and so i think shanghai may not necessarily you know, emerge as a forerunner although we we see it as that because of the free trade zone i think this is going to be a very interesting discussion in say five years time 
but I think we feel confident for the really international disputes that there's going to be very much a vital role that Hong Kong will play in those disputes going yep, forward. I see. Andrew, if I can just add to what Sarah and Path have said, I'm currently handling a number of arbitrations, some with very established arbitration centres like HKIC and SIC and, and others from emerging regional arbitration centres, and I can definitely testify to the difference in, in experience. What we find is usually with the institution and uh, a tribunal from the emerging centres, they tend to be relatively less experienced, as Sarah mentioned, and that reflects in some degree of reluctance in intervening and pushing the arbitration along in terms of exercising their functions and power. So I think that difference in experience will reflect in the future in terms of how parties choose their seat of arbitration. Okay, thank you for that. My second general question was actually for you, Murphy. There's a lot of coverage in the local press and indeed even some in the international press recently about supposed brain drain from the professions in Hong Kong of foreign and other professionals. Does this affect the arbitration sector or do you think it will? Is this something we should be concerned about? That's a really good question, Andrew, and I think subject to what Sarah and, and Kath think, in my personal experience, I, I don't think we've seen a significant net brain drain in the arbitration sector in Hong Kong. We continue to see a lot of highly qualified talents, especially with mainland background and Chinese language skills to be coming uh, and joining the, the community in Hong Kong, probably recognizing the strength of Hong Kong as a leading arbitration center in this part of the world. Uh, and in fact, I think the sector has been quite successful in attracting both overseas and mainland talents, despite the, the developments in recent years. And, and we expect to see this to continue in the future. And I think there are a number of reasons for this. Obviously, starting point is Hong Kong remains as one of the leading arbitration centers in the world. And the statistics shared by both Kath and Sarah earlier demonstrate this. The second is, I think Hong Kong is improving in terms of its competitiveness as a seat. And as Kath mentioned just last month, the Law Reform Commission approved recommendations for parties to adopt success fee structures by a special committee. What Kath didn't mention is she was the co-chair of that committee. And if that is amended into law, it will only make Hong Kong even more appealing as a seat. On the third point, more China-related arbitrations in the coming years in areas like technology, Greater Bay Area, and the Belt and Road Initiative. We think the demand for arbitration talents in Hong Kong will remain high. And given Hong Kong's geographical position and infrastructure, I don't think it will be a main problem in terms of suffering brain drain. Thank you. That's very reassuring. I've got quite a few questions, including some which have come to me by people who said I should have remembered that today was the opening of the legal year ceremony, and therefore that's why they're not partaking in this. Uh, be that as it may, before going to those questions, perhaps I should ask our chairman, who is obviously also a very senior practicing lawyer, whether she would like to come in at this point and perhaps um, have a question also from her perspective. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, but not in the area of arbitration. I'm learning a lot. Sarah, I wanted to ask you, do you see a particular role for Hong Kong and HKIAC in the Greater Bay Area? Do you think it offers particular opportunities? What would be the position of HKIAC in the Greater Bay Area? Yeah, I think we already have a very important role in the Greater Bay Area because when I look at all of the cases that are coming from mainland Chinese parties, a very large proportion of those mainland Chinese parties are from the Greater Bay Area. So I think there's already an interaction there that's really important. I think that Hong Kong in that space is a very important jurisdiction in terms of one to which the other jurisdictions can look in terms of arbitration legislation. Kat's already alluded to the fact that the PRC legislation is being revised at the moment to more closely match the ANSI trial model law, some of the fundamental aspects that you find in an ANSI trial model law jurisdiction. For example, that it is uh, the tribunal that will determine its competence, um, that you can obtain interim relief from an arbitral tribunal. The extent to which those revisions will take effect is as yet unclear. The cons consultation period has passed. And I think some of those fundamental changes will um, present uh, challenges in terms of how far that legislation can be amended without impacting other legislation. So I think Hong Kong provides that kind of model on which those jurisdictions can look to. The other thing is in Hong Kong, you have so many practitioners and arbitrators who are experienced in a wide range of arbitrations. And there is now the opportunity for Hong Kong lawyers to be qualified 
um, in the GBA, and that examination has been made available. And I'm not sure how many Hong Kong lawyers have taken it, but I think maybe under 100. But so the interaction is going in that way as well. So those arbitrators can also work in respect of disputes coming out of the GBA and, and share their expertise that way as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's, again, yet another positive. I, I think I'd better pay attention to some of the questions coming in. Uh, let me just give you a couple at once in the interests of time. The first one comes, there's no name attached to it, but it says, how would a tribunal resist political pressure to favour a state-owned corporation? Not entirely sure what's meant by that, but I assume it's an oblique reference to Chinese SOEs. And secondly, and completely differently, I, I think probably for Sarah, could you give a, a more specific number of cases dealt with by the HKIAC relating to intellectual property, including those that involve IP, but are counted by you as uh, trade or sale of goods in, in a general way? Slightly different questions. Shall I take the first one? Perhaps? Please, please. Yeah, yeah. I think on the first one, one of the advantages of arbitration is that it's a private consensual process. So it's outside the court system in that sense and the ability to choose arbitrators, to choose your panel. So in most complex or high value contracts, you will provide for three arbitrators and therefore you as one party has the choice of your arbitrator. And there are provisions in the HKAC rules and most um, other institutional rules for the neutrality in particular of the chair of the tribunal so that the chair of the tribunal would be of a different nationality to either of the two contracting parties or obviously there's a state and then you would have a neutral chair and so you you immediately remove the suggestion that, that the tribunal might be in some way biased towards a particular entity and I think historically when I first came to Hong Kong which was in 2002 I was instructed so I came I was hired to work on a series of state-owned enterprise arbitrations at HKIC under trial rules and PRC governing law Hong Kong seat and these were disputes between an, a Chinese SOE and a Hong Kong investor involving projects in, in Guangzhou. So there were two very major arbitrations. And then the feeling was that the Chinese side would appoint a Chinese arbitrator and the Hong Kong investor appointed an international arbitrator, and then you would have a neutral chair. And in, in one of those decisions, it's fair that the Chinese arbitrator dissented. And again, it didn't matter because the arbitration decision is decided by the majority and the dissent did not affect the impact or finality of the award. And so that it was particularly important then to ensure that you had a neutral chair to avoid any sort of suggestion that there might be favoritism to be towards one side or the other because you want a neutral panel. I have to say that since then, the arbitrators coming out of the mainland come with stellar reputations as being neutral, as deciding on the merits of the case. And it's very rare now to see a dissenting opinion in favour of one party or the other. So my view would be there are ways, you know, arbitration gives you that real kind of neutrality of the decision-making process. But having said that, if you go to the Hong Kong courts and look at all the Hong Kong case authorities, there's a plethora of decisions making adverse findings against, if, this, if it means Chinese state-owned enterprises. So the decisions coming out of the courts are equally neutral in that context, if that provides reassurance. Yeah, several questions which relate to what at least uh, two of the speakers touched on concerning uh, virtual arbitration and whether we go back to a new normal and so forth, and more particularly whether virtual technology makes Hong Kong in a way less different, because we, we used to advertise ourselves, did we not, because of our geographical position and our quick access of flight times and all the rest of it, that was one of the selling points. But we may need a separate webinar on this, I think. It's a huge subject uh, all by its own, and I am conscious of the fact that time is running by. So maybe I just uh, conclude with one final question for everyone. One. Where do you see, given all these factors, given all the things we've been talking about, where do you see the HKIAC or your own business at HSF in five years time? But if you could just make it make one minute takeaway for us. So maybe let's unfairly start with Sarah. And see where you... Thanks, Andrew. I think uh, HKIAC will continue to provide excellent service. That's what we have strived to do day in, day out, week in, week out for years. And that's what we'll continue to do. I think we will remain highly relevant for any dispute involving a mainland Chinese element. And I uh, think that will be an important aspect of HKIC's future. Murphy, before finishing with Catherine, perhaps. 
Thank you, Andrew. I, I think, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, probably in the coming years, we'll continue to see a large number of China-related arbitration and disputes, particularly in the infrastructure and construction space driven by the national initiatives in this area. We have a long history of servicing Chinese clients and we have a long history of servicing Hong Kong as an arbitration center. So I think uh, we'll continue to consolidate that experience and go with where the clients investments and projects go. Thank you. And a final word from uh, Catherine. I, I just echo everything that Sarah and Murphy have said. I think we are thriving and we will continue to thrive like all arbitration practices in Hong Kong. It's a thriving jurisdiction. And I think with, with the arrival of success fees, hopefully this year in some format will bring us in line with all the other sort of leading arbitration seats, including Singapore, which is currently undergoing similar reform. And in fact, our reform is broader. So I think we will go from strength to strength. And as a practice, we operate across not just Hong Kong and China, but across Asia. And every aspect of our business is, is busy and will continue to be. And that's just a, a testament to the investment and to the, the transactions that are going on across the region and where there are transactions. As Julia will know, disputes follow. So that's good for us, I think. Thank you. The ones I work on, Catherine. Oh, yes. Many thanks to uh, all three of uh, our speakers um, are in order, I believe, for combining so much. I found it an almost uh, an information overload, totally fascinating. So much professional knowledge, but also practical experience put so precisely and concisely. And apart from lots and lots of specific takeaways, I at least was really encouraged by the positive and indeed almost partly dominating role that Hong Kong is increasingly taking up in the arbitration field. I think this is a especially welcome uh, reminder of Hong Kong's resilience in these rather stressful times that we're all going through at the moment. I'd also like to thank all participants for their time and penetrating questions. Uh, there'll be a recording of the webinar put up on the website, and please do keep an eye out for future CCC Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong events. Whether or not you are free to sign up for our Chinese New Year banquet, if it's not cancelled, on the 16th of February at the China Club, let me also wish you all a very happy uh, New Year of the Tiger. And uh, may I now hand the virtual floor back to uh, our chairman, Julia Charlton, for her concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So that brings us to the conclusion of our webinar. Thank you all so much for being with us today. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, Sarah Grimmer, Catherine Sanger, and Murphy Mock, who gave us some great insights into the importance of Hong Kong in the world of arbitration. And thanks also to our great moderator, Andrew Wells. So your views matter to us. So before leaving, please, could you kindly complete the evaluation form that's linked in the chat box? Once you click the link, please scan the QR code and you'll be able to use it. At the same time, if you'd like to join the Commonwealth Chamber of Commerce Hong Kong, you can tick the box option. We're looking forward to seeing you all again and happy year of the tiger. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.